Hi Evie and thanks very much for your question. There are lots of ways we can do that. You know, we do know that time's running out and I know that you know that and many other young children too. But there's lots that we can do still to save the planet. And those go from little things at home like turning out the lights and recycling or reusing. Have you got any toys, you know, that as Christmas coming up, maybe you should think, maybe I can reuse these toys or we can upcycle them or we can share them with somebody else. Those kind of things to make sure that there's less stuff around because all stuff creates those polluting emissions, you know, that destroy our environment as well. And you can have a voice, Evie. So I just want to show you something that I'm taking with me to COP26, the big meeting of all the climate leaders across all of the countries in the world. And it's a message from our local village. So maybe you want to get together with your Youth Eco Council or with other people in your area to send messages. And I'm very happy to you know, receive those as well, Evie, and send them to the climate leaders. Quite a few things, uh, small little actions that people can take, ranging to bigger actions. One of the simplest things I think is always to be aware of the carbon impacts of the activities at home. So for instance, when you're boiling water to make a cup of tea, don't always uh, fill the kettle. If you're not in a room in the house, turn the temperature down or turn it off completely. Uh, make sure that your house has a good insulation on the roof. Make sure that uh, droughts not coming in through the windows. So really reduce how much uh, energy is needed to heat up your room to make it uh, comfortable. But also everyday life. So when you have a, a product like a phone or an iron, something is not working, you don't have to always buy a new one. Try to uh, repair it as a first thing before you now consider buying a new one. So there are various things that we can adapt, we can change in our everyday lives. Once we are aware of what the impact of activities are, then we can, we can try and take steps in uh, making sure that we don't necessarily contribute to carbon emissions wherever we can avoid them. Um, thank you. And your question is, you know, one of the most important if we're really going to bring down carbon emissions in time. Because as we know that 40% of the emissions from housing comes from heating houses that are already built, you know, houses like yours. Um, and it's those really tricky houses, you know, like you say, in the middle of the terrace, not much room. How do you afford it? Well, we've been waiting until this last week for the government to come out with their heating and decarbonisation strategy. And what they have provided, because it shouldn't be those who are least able to afford this that have to bear the costs. Um, what they've provided now are grants up to £5,000 for people to be able to provide um, the heat pumps within their homes. Um, and they've also provided funding for those who are in social housing and those who are in fuel poverty. That means those who have to choose between heating their homes or feeding their children or buying things for school. Um, what you can do is work with others around you that are up there in the terrace to look at those grants and see whether it's worth doing something for the whole terrace. And that's really, really good. But obviously, in the end, what we need is for the government to provide the funding we need for local authorities to be able to do mass retrofitting, which will provide jobs for everybody in villages, towns and cities of, you know, around the country. It's uh, never too late. There's a lot that has been done already, and there's still quite a lot to be done, and we're making very, very good progress. And I'll try and give some examples. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, solar power was very expensive. The costs have more than halved in the last 10 years. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to have solar power on a very small scale, but also on a very large scale. Wind power as well. In the past, there was a lot more opposition to people having wind turbines locally. Now we have a lot more wind power on land, but also quite a lot offshore as well. And the price is coming down. There are also new forms of renewable energy that are continuing to be developed and made more commercially viable, including, for instance, wave energy. So all these new energy forms of generation and storage, they're helping us to make sure that uh, emissions, at least from energy generation, are reduced. 
There's also quite a lot of ongoing research on developing new solutions that can help us in uh, mitigating climate change in our everyday lives. So it's not too late. Quite a lot of work has been done. There's still quite a lot of research going on. We still have a way to go, but we are making good progress so far. Greg, thanks for that really important question. And if I'd like to add a little bit to your question, which is what we've been asking ourselves. So on the one hand, as you said, we're a very wet area, so we've got to look at flooding and flood risk, which is increasing. But also, we're also in one of the driest areas in the country, and we already have a water supply crisis. So we've got to look at both of those things, because the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough climate report that was just published says that we're going to have increased rainfall and increased heat waves and drought. So yes, what are we doing? For the new local plan, we've commissioned evidence to help us understand this. So we have one of the first water supply studies that tells us where should we have housing, where shouldn't we have housing in order to make sure that we don't increase that flood risk, but also that we can be efficient with the use of water and also leave areas for nature to naturally replenish our groundwater aquifers. And we're working in partnership on that local plan with Cambridge City Council as part of the Greater Cambridge local plan. And we're also working with the combined authority to address what the report starkly shows we need to do. Thank you for that question, Paul. I think children have a big role to play. They're really able to understand things uh, in a very simple manner. So the first thing is to, I always say this, try to keep it simple so that children can understand what are we talking about. It's the environment, what are the issues, what are the impacts, but then also what do we want them to do. So the first thing I would say is to help them to understand what are the real issues, what does CO2 mitigation mean, what does that look like. So take them outside, they can see the effects of climate change, they can see areas where there has been deforestation, they can see areas where there is no more green growth. They can see areas where there's a lot of pollution. And then once they understand what the impacts are, we can then begin to educate them on the small steps they can take to mitigate that. So for instance, they shouldn't waste food. If they waste food, what happens? We have to collect the food that is wasted. We have to take it somewhere by transport. That's more emissions. And then we have to treat it. So very, very simple things like don't waste your food. And then also try to reuse as much as you can, try to recycle and also teach and encourage your friends to do the same. So from them understanding what the impacts are and knowing what actions they can take themselves, they're very, very key players in the issue of mitigating climate change. very much for that question. So there, there are different things that I've done and like others you want to see what individual changes you can make to your own, you know, to your own life. So in terms of work what I've done is I've reduced the amount that I fly. I work internationally but now I do a lot of work on the, through the internet um, instead of flying. So I've reduced that hugely. Also I do a lot of cycling. So I cycle also to where my office is here. Um, we just have one car in the house, but we, you know, we're really cut down our use of, of the car. And also it's about waste. So we're really looking at how we can drive down our food waste. Um, and it's my husband who's much better than that than I am. He wants to eat what's in the fridge before we get something new. And I'm not very good at it, so that's you know, something I want to get better at. So it's reducing that food waste and the recycling. We've also put in some solar panels and it's just such fun to see that you're generating free, clean energy, you know? And it also heats up our water as well. So those are the few things we're doing. So we try and make it as easy for people as possible. The simplest form is a curbside collection, which we also have for people that live in flats. Or you can actually take our recyclables to our bring sites or to the recycling center. For people that live in flats, uh, wherever they put uh, the wrong materials out, yes, we do not uh, collect, co collect them. But there's a very simple way around that. Everybody can go on our website, type in any material you have, maybe a cling film or tetra pack, 
and you will know whether or not you collect them at the curbside or if you need to take them to a different location. And there's a reason for that. There's some facilities that we have, our treatment facilities, that accept some materials and some don't. So we are very, very keen that you put out the right materials to the right collection points. And the simplest way is just to go on site, or go on, uh, online and type in the material and we'll tell you whether or not we can collect it in the curbside or whether you should take it to a different facility. So hopefully this will guide our residents in the future. This is a really, really important question and it's one that councils across the country, including ours, are struggling to, to deal with. Um, and what we need to do is get more public charging points in areas that already exist, like where you live. Um, the government produced a decarbonisation of transport strategy um, and in it what we're asking them is to do more about giving the mandate and authority to local councils to work out where those charging points go. At the moment no one's responsible for it, so it's really hard to do it strategically. So that's one of the things we're taking to COP26 next week. Um, but meanwhile, if there is an area that you would like and others would like to have a public charging point, then do get in contact with the county council because it's mapping out there where people voluntarily want to work on that in their streets. And meanwhile, in our planning, and I'm chair of the planning committee too, we're making sure that any new developments do have EV charging points you know, baked into the design of the new developments. I think it's going to be a very different from where we are today it's going to be a lot better but i think also it's going to be going back to probably how we lived maybe hundreds of years ago we're going to travel less in our own cars i believe we're going to share cars a lot more there'll be less individual ownership of cars and also we'll cut down on transport using cars i think we're going to be living much more communally and there'll be many reasons for that one being that um we we'll probably need to live uh, in small or large groups to be able to make the most of the energy infrastructure that we need. Either we'll have a communal solar power, a communal wind power, other forms of uh, energy. It will be a lot more economical, a lot more practical to do that on a medium scale. It could be that we also have a communal water treatment, communal sewage treatment. It will make it uh, a lot easier and a lot more efficient. I believe also in the future, a lot of our food, a lot of the food that we eat, will be locally produced. We'll probably have uh, local sources for everyday vegetables, for milk, for eggs. I think a lot of those will be grown either in our own local garden or communal gardens. And I think also that um, we will have a very, very good understanding of our carbon impacts. A lot of things will be done automatically, I think in the houses we live in. We'll have uh, a lot of gadgets that are just our usage, that are just our consumption, just by default. But we as individuals, we as uh, consumers, we as uh, citizens, will have a lot more understanding of what carbon is, of what our impacts are. And I think carbon may even be a currency, maybe a commodity. So for instance, it may be that uh, I have to travel to London today, straight away, I will know what my carbon impacts are gonna be if I have to go by car, for instance, and I will then trade that with you and say, okay, in return, I'm going to arrange to plant half a tree. Could you plant half a tree with me to mitigate my carbon impacts? So I think it's going to be a different world. It won't be as complicated as it sounds because I think a lot of the carbon will be done by default, but also we will have grown in our awareness of what we're doing. And it will be more natural to try to take steps to mitigate our impacts on the environment. I think it's been a lovely, lovely time. I hope I'm still here then. And I hope the world is a lot greener at that time.